Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Donc, c'est un plaisir d'accueillir David Pritchard, qui est maître de conférence donc à l'université de Queensland en Australie et qui est en ce moment aussi chercheur à l'université de Strasbourg. David Pritchard a un curriculum vitae extraordinairement impressionnant. Donc, est, il est difficile à, à présenter tant il couvre de sujets. Euh, des sujets qui sont en plus des sujets extrêmement euh, importants, euh, qui intéressent, je crois, toutes celles et tous ceux qui travaillent euh, sur euh, l'histoire euh, ancienne, et en particulier l'histoire de l'Antiquité euh, grecque. Et il suffit, je crois, de, de, de rappeler euh, les thèmes pour comprendre à quel point euh, les recherches de David Pluchard euh, couvrent un, un champ euh, large. Euh, il euh, s'intéresse en particulier au sport, euh, donc sujet sur lequel il a publié déjà euh, un certain nombre d'ouvrages et d'articles. Il a publié euh, aussi beaucoup et il continue à publier sur euh, la question de la guerre et de la démocratie, qui est un sujet extrêmement euh, important pour saisir la, la caractéristique, je crois, de, de ce que euh, peuvent être les démocraties euh, anciennes, ce qui l'amène aussi je, à euh, réfléchir avec des euh, chercheurs et chercheuses dans d'autres domaines, euh, sur la question de la démocratie et il a publié euh, avec d'autres euh, chercheurs euh, une tribune euh, dans le journal Le Monde euh, consacrée à ce sujet, ce qui euh, je crois euh, témoigne de l'importance de nos recherches et qui au-delà de l'érudition euh, qui constitue euh, au fond le ticket d'entrée euh, de notre travail montre que ce que nous faisons euh, sur euh, la démocratie en particulier n'a pas pour vocation simplement à éclairer euh, des détails de euh, l'Antiquité, mais aussi à nous permettre de mieux réfléchir à ce que peut être la démocratie euh, aujourd'hui. Et euh, parce que c'est un sujet d'actualité et qu'il est à Strasbourg, au mois de juillet, euh, un, un grand, grand colloque euh, est euh, organisé euh, autour euh, de l'ouvrage de Nicole Leroux, donc l'invention d'Athènes, cet ouvrage consacré euh, euh, à l'oraison funèbre, à ce type de discours donc, que les Athéniens euh, faisaient prononcer à l'un d'entre eux chaque année euh, pour les morts euh, tombés euh, à la guerre. Et euh, donc 40 ans après cet ouvrage, et c'est un, un colloque international qui va réunir euh, tous les spécialistes et toutes les spécialistes qui ont euh, eu à travailler sur la question. C'est donc un grand événement euh, euh, scientifique euh, qui ne manquera pas de donner lieu, j'imagine, à une publication qui... Euh, euh, permettra euh, de euh, véritablement, je crois, euh, marquer les esprits et surtout euh, d'organiser euh, un pont euh, entre l'historiographie française euh, qui illustre tellement euh, Nicole Leroux, euh, en particulier par son style euh, d'écriture, euh, et euh, l'historiographie anglo-saxonne euh, qui, euh, peut-être, n'a pas toujours su saisir l'importance de la réflexion de Nicole Leroux tant elle était inscrite dans le paysage historiographique euh, français. Parmi les ouvrages euh, récents, euh, et surtout en, en lien avec la conférence que David Pritchard va, va nous proposer euh, aujourd'hui, il faut citer bien sûr « Public Spending and Democracy in Classical Athens », donc euh, un livre consacré euh, aux euh, dépenses publiques et à euh, la démocratie à Athènes. Alors c'est un ouvrage important, bien entendu, euh, pour le thème qui est traité, mais c'est un ouvrage particulièrement important pour nous ici euh, à Bordeaux, puisque depuis déjà plusieurs dizaines d'années, euh, le Centre Ozonius et les chercheurs qui ont travaillé à l'Université bordeaux Montaigne se sont spécialisés en histoire économique. Et donc c'est évidemment avec euh, grand intérêt que euh, nous euh, allons entendre David Pritchard, puisque le thème de sa conférence aujourd'hui euh, consiste à, à reprendre la question des dépenses publiques à euh, Athènes, 200 ans après l'ouvrage majeur euh, d'Auguste Böck, euh, qui a vraiment euh, lancé euh, la réflexion sur le sujet et qui euh, aussi marque, je crois, le début des études scientifiques euh, sur euh, l'Antiquité. C'est donc avec un plaisir non dissimulé euh, que je passe la parole à David Pritchard pour une conférence intitulée Public Spending in Democratic Athens, 200 years, no, 200 years after August Bock. <laughs> Merci, uh, David. Thank you. Um... I'll begin uh, by saying a few words in French. Uh, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Je remercie Christophe Pébat de sa présentation très généreuse. Malheureusement, je continue, je, je continue à mal parler votre belle mais difficile langue. Par conséquent, j'essaierai de dire seulement 
quelques mots très simples avant de lire ma conférence en anglais. Je suis absolument enchanté d'être ici à l'Université Bordeaux-Montagne. Bordeaux D'abord, j'ai été surpris, agréablement surpris, lorsque Christophe m'a invité à participer à votre série de conférences. Et je n'ai pas hésité une seconde à accepter son invitation. Votre université est de loin le centre le plus important pour la recherche sur la grecque antique en France. En tant que chercheur, j'ai lu des ouvrages innombrables écrits par les historiens de cette université. Ce soir, par exemple, je parlerai des dépenses publiques de Athènes, de, de, de l'Athènes classique. Vous verrez clairement que ma conférence est énormément rédévable au livre de Christophe Pébat. Alain Bresson et, bien sûr, Patrice Brown. Je suis ravi aussi d'être ici sous l'égide de la Revue des études sanciennes. Cette revue est bien connue à l'étranger. J'ai souvent cité ces articles qu'elle a publiés. Enfin, je suis vraiment désolé de ne pas bien parler français. Quand j'étais très jeune, très petite, très petit en fait, je l'ai étudié un peu. Actuellement, à Strasbourg, c'est vrai, je me suis inscrit à un cours de français. Mais je peux dire que pour une personne comme moi, de âge moyen, ce n'est pas si facile de prendre la langue parlée. Mais, heureusement, je peux le comprendre un peu lorsque les gens s'expriment. Par conséquent, je, je vous demanderai de bien vouloir poser vos questions en français à la fin de ma conférence. Si je n'ai pas compris les questions, ce n'est pas grave. Je suis certain, certain qu'il y aura dans l'assistance une personne qui pourra en faire la traduction. À présent, je vais lire très lentement mon texte en anglais. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, for the many people in the audience, I, you have a handout, and on the handout there is a sommaire en français. In addition, uh, audience members have a copy of the English language text, which I will now read. In Die Staatshaushaltung der Athener of 1817, August Burke criticized the classical Athenian demos, the classical Athenian people, for spending more on festivals than on wars by, quote, squandering away the public revenue in shows and banquets at home, unquote. They caused their armed forces to be, quote, in a continually declining state, unquote. For Burke, this policy was, quote, unjust and inexpedient inasmuch as the continuance of it without oppressing the Allies was impossible, and the state being deprived of the means of self-defense in a most frivolous and unpardonable manner was led on to a certain destruction." Unquote. In support of his criticism, Burke cited an assembly speech of 352 BCE, in which Demosthenes, seen here, unfavorably compared Athens's waging of war to its staging of festivals. Quote, in matters pertaining to war and its preparations, everything is disordered, uncorrected, and indeterminate. Unquote. Consequently, Demosthenes continues, all naval expeditions are sent out too late to prevent Philip II of Macedonia taking city after city. By contrast, the preparations for the city Dionysia and the great Panathenia 
are ordered by law, guaranteeing that the sponsors of the choruses and the travel teams know exactly what to do. And, quote, nothing remains unexamined and indeterminate, unquote. For Demosthenes, the result was that the two festivals took place on time, had great crowds and preparations than any other, and used up more money than was spent on even a single naval expedition. Burke suggested that this, quote, weak point, unquote, was also recognised by Plutarch, who proposed in his essay on the glory of Athens, quote, if the cost of the production of each drama were reckoned, the Athenian people would appear to have spent more on the production of Bacchuses and Phoenician women and Oedipuses and the misfortunes of Medeas and Electras than they did on maintaining their empire and fighting for their liberty against the Persians, unquote. Those are fighting words. In the two volumes of his The Public Economy of Athens, Burke exhaustively discussed the evidence that was available at the time on the scale and the expenses of the festivals of classical Athens and its armed forces. The citizens of this polis, this city-state, inscribed many of their assembly decrees on stone and insisted that their magistrates do the same as you see here with financial accounts. Burke was the first to realise, page two, to realise fully the importance of such epigraphical evidence for ancient history. Consequently, more than one quarter of the public economy of Athens is taken up by his discussion of various inscriptions. This realisation prompted Burke, as he was writing his book, to begin the first collection of Greek inscriptions. But his corpus proved to be a much larger task than he had anticipated, and so was only completed by others 50 years later. Since its completion, several hundreds of new stelae from classical Attica have been discovered. Therefore, in spite of his exhaustiveness, Burke therefore saw only a fraction of the inscriptions that we have today. Burke had no access either to the constitution of the Athenians that ancient writers, along with penguin editors, attributed to Aristotle. Believe it or not, in 1891, the British Museum caused a worldwide sensation when it announced its discovery of this lost treatise on four rolls of papyrus from Egypt. Today's majority view is that its author was not Aristotle, but one of his students in his school in Athens. This treatise expanded enormously our knowledge of this state's institutions. When he wrote The Public Economy of Athens, Burke simply lacked the evidence to calculate how much the classical Athenians spent on their two major public activities. Two centuries after his book, this is no longer the case. Consequently, in this book, I am able to estimate the costs of Athenian festivals and wars. By doing so, this book tests Burke's harsh criticism of Athenian, Athenian spending priorities and the literary evidence that he cited in its support. The task of estimating total spending on Athenian festivals is made easier by recent studies of the cost of the festival of the city Dionysia. The festivals of the city Dionysia and the great Panath Panathenia were, were by far the largest of the Athenian polis. Consequently, costing either festival sheds light on a significant proportion of the full cost of its festival program. 
The first to do so carefully for the city Dionysia were Eric Sharpo and William Slater. In this book, The Context of Ancient Drama, they concluded that Athens of the latter 5th century contributed six talents to the city Dionysia, while its core sponsors spent 18 talents, 5,800 drachmas of their own money. Sharpo and Slater's figures were initially supported by Peter Wilson, whose independent calculations in this book, The Athenian Institution of the Choregia, resulted in a figure of 18 talents for five days of choral competitions. Subsequently, after this book, Wilson completed a new study of this question as part of the project that he and Sharpo co-directed on the social and economic history of ancient Greek drama. His study draws on a vast array of often overlooked evidence from classical Attica and comparative material from elsewhere in order to estimate how much this festival cost. His initial figure for public spending on the pay of the poets and musicians, page three, the equipment and the beasts for sacrifice is 13 talents, 1,300 drachmas, while the private outlay of the chorus sponsors and the supervisors of the procession adds up to 15 talents, 3,900 drachmas. Of these costings, this last attempt by Wilson is by far the most reliable. Therefore, therefore, his grand total of 28 talents, 5,200 drachmas, that is some 754 kilograms of silver, yes, a lot of money, this costing for this, the cost of the city Dionysia will be incorporated into my own calculations. These costings have renewed the early confidence in Burke's view of what classical Athens spent on its festivals and his literary evidence for it. For example, Sharpo and Slater believe that the comment of Plutarch, quote, and I will not endeavour to reproduce their Canadian accent, quote, uh, the comment of Plutarch, quote, though exaggerated, is not wildly so, unquote. Citing their figures, Lisa Callet suggests that the two passages, quote, reflect a popular perception of heavy expenditure on festivals, uh, unquote, which Callet believes is factually correct. While Wilson concludes, quote, ancient claims about Athenian, Athenian expenditure on the theatre are fully justified, unquote. Such conclusions bolster the long-held view that religion was the topmost priority of the Greek polis in classical times. Some who hold this view even argue that the appeasing of the gods was the highest priority of the Athenian demos. For example, Hugh Bowden in this book concludes, quote, Athenian democracy was above all a system for establishing and reinforcing the will of the gods, unquote. For Bowden, the enormous sums that it spent on festivals bear this point out. These ancient historians question the consensus of those working on Athenian wars. Military historians hold the view that the military spending of classical Athens far exceeded what it spent on all its other public activities combined. With only a handful of exceptions, however, they have shied away from estimating war's full financial cost because of, it, because of its great variability from year to year. Instead, 
These military historians only aim for a general sense of the scale of military spending by detailing the known costs of sieges, the known recurring uh, spending on a particular military branch, or their own uh, calculations of the cost of an average armada. This means that it is simply not possible to settle this public spending debate as it currently stands. Those renewing Burke's hostile view have only costed a part of the state's festival program, while the opposing view of military historians is only based on some of war's costs. In the hope of settling this two centuries old debate, my Public Spending and Democracy in Classical Athens estimates the full cost of these two major public activities. However, it is only possible to do this from 430 to 350 BCE. For these 80 years, spending on state-sponsored festivals was remarkably stable. This means that we can make cost estimates of Athenian festivals on the basis of the surviving evidence from across these 80 years. This is simply not the case with military spending. The loss of at least one half of the citizen population during the Peloponnesian War and the collapse of the tribute-bearing empire at this war's end massively reduced the scale of war that Athens, page, page 4, could, wa could wage in the 4th century. Consequently, my book costs the armed forces in the 420s and the 370s. The significant changes that Athens made to the financing of festivals after 350 entirely, rules out, entirely rule out estimates of their costs after this date. In classical Athens, the demos had full control over public spending. Consequently, a festival could only be expanded or a new one added to the state's program by an assembly decree. By the 430s, the Athenians had long appointed magistrates to manage their festivals alongside the cult personnel that had traditionally done so. The demos supervised closely how much was spent on each heorter or festival. They regularly set a festival's budget in whole or part. The earliest surviving example of such festival budgeting is a decree of the 460s concerning the mysteries at Eleusis. In it, the demos set the fees that this cult, this cult's priests and priestesses could charge initiates. They set to how much of the sacred funds could be spent on the mysteries. When the demos judged that a deity did not have enough money for his or her worship, they often introduced a new tax on those who apparently benefited the most from that deity's charis, or sense of gratitude. The demos had no less control over the funding of, funding of the armed forces. Whether, for example, warships would be built, and if so, how many, came down to their vote. Assembly decrees were also required for spending, for example, on the dockyards and other military capital. Likewise, the demos set the misthos, the pay of the cavalry corps, which was the army's costliest recurring cost. The expedition that Athens sent to Sicily in 416 illustrates how assembly goers sought to control the cost of each campaign. With this expedition, they may have authorised their generals to work out its requirements, but they still passed a decree 
on its size and budget. Because this expedition, as you all know, went from bad to worse, repeated votes were taken on committing extra resources. The Athenian assembly may have controlled public spending, but day-to-day -day financial oversight fell to the Democratic Council of 500. In his description of the Athenian constitution, Aristotle's pupil explains how this council, quote, administers together with the other magistrates most financial matters, unquote. The Boulaire, the council, oversaw both income and expenditure. Consequently, Athena's treasurers, for example, took over the money from their predecessors in the council's presence. In classical Athens, it was the politai, the sellers, who auctioned the leases of public lands and silver mines, the contracts for tax collecting, and the property of defendants that the law courts had confiscated. These auctions were conducted before the boulaire itself, which apparently chose the winning auction bids, page five. The council also held records of the instalments that the auction winners had to pay. Instalments were thus paid to the apodecti, the receivers, in the council chamber itself. The boulaire ensured that the revenue so raised was allocated to the magistrates in charge of the funds for different public activities and spent only on what the demos had authorised. The Council of 500 met on no less than 275 days per year. Public finance apparently was discussed in almost all of its meetings. In his constitution of the Athenians, seen here, Pseudo-Xenophon made, quote, provision of money, unquote, second only to the war, quote, unquote, in his list of the matters on which the Boulaire invariably deliberated. In particular, it was responsible for making sure that there, there was always enough income to cover expenditure. What allowed it to fulfil this responsibility was its supervision of the state's treasurers and other financial magistrates. Each of these financial boards may have managed an important aspect, an important part of public finance, but the bulletai, the councillors over, uh, oversaw all aspects and so could form the fullest picture, the most detailed picture of the Athenian state's fiscal position. P.J. Rhodes concludes, and here we see P.J. Rhodes in his beloved uh, Durham, uh, Durham in front of his beloved cathedral. P.J. Rhodes concludes, quote, only the Boulaire had access to the information which would show whether the city could afford some new charge on its resources. And this must have been the reason for the Boulaire's financial predominance. It was made like this, unquote. In Athenian democracy, the council drafted the probulermata, the preliminary proposals, that the assembly debated and voted on. The demos could accept, modify or reject such a, propo such a proposal, but it could not consider an issue that was not covered by a probulema. probulema. This meant that if bulletai were concerned about a funding shortfall, a lack of funds, they could bring it to the people's attention and propose a way to meet it. Hence, the setting of the Assembly's agenda by the Boulaire guaranteed that its detailed knowledge of the, of the state's overall fiscal position fed into the Assembly's debates about public spending. 
In classical Athens, politicians also required a good knowledge of public finance. Aristotle and Xenophon listed the five most important items of public business on which they had to be capable of speaking. In each of their lists, public finance was the topmost item. These two writers agreed on the facts and the figures related to public spending and revenue that a diligent would-be leader would have at his fingertips. For them, the overarching goal that a politician should have was to make the state richer. This goal required him to know its prosodoi, its income streams, and the total they came to. He should be capable, capable of suggesting new income streams and ways of increasing underperforming income streams. For these writers, a competent, a competent politician knew too, to quote Aristotle, quote, all of the city's dapanai, or expenses, unquote. As part of his effort to enrich it, he could tell the demos, page six, which expenses were unnecessary and so dispensable, and how the costs of others could be reduced. The requirement that politicians have such detailed financial knowledge indicates that they also played an important part in the Assembly's public spending debates. Certainly, the Boulea, the Democratic Council, was primarily responsible for aggregating the disparate data on Athens' overall fiscal position. But it was the public speakers who communicated this financial information to the demos and argued the pros and the cons of each proposal. Therefore, if a politician wanted to support a pro bulerma or to propose a modified version, he needed to be capable, capable of both estimating its cost accurately and relating this da panea to the state's total income and total spending. In response to a rival politician's branding of such a proposal as unaffordable, it cost too much, he would have to tell assembly goers how its cost could be reduced or where a new prosodos, a new income stream could be found to pay for it. The Athenian demos understood clearly the financial implications of their decisions. When they voted to create a festival or to start a war, they had a good idea what it would cost. Their politicians had told them which prosodos could be used or whether it required a new income stream or the tapping of cash reserves. In voting on a proposal, assembly goers assessed whether it, to quote, to quote Christoph Paybart, quote, integrated their concerns about the redistribution of state revenues, unquote. In other words, they were roughly deciding what proportion of the state's income it should use up. What they had learnt outside the assembly made it easier for them to make such budgeting decisions. Classical Attica had an economy with a strong, strong market component in which coins were used to a large degree. Consequently, non-elite Athenians simply had to budget in order to make their personal ends meet. They participated in their villages or city suburbs of assembly whose overriding task, as surviving decrees make clear, was to balance the deem's budget. Most of them, at least in the 4th century, also served once or twice on the Boulea and so had direct experience of financial planning at the state level. In adjudicating assembly debates about public spending, the demos also consolidated their general knowledge of what the state as a whole spent 
on major public activities. They actually learnt about financial realities by making decisions about public finances. Christoph P. Barth rightly states in this book, quote, simply by their, by their participation in the assembly, the citizens progressively collected a certain amount of general financial information, unquote. This allowed assembly goers to sense if a proposal would cost the same as what they normally spent on such things. This made it easier for them to change their normal spending pattern. And so what they spent on one class of public activities relative to other public activities. Such votes allowed the demos to spend more on what they saw as a priority and less on what they saw as less of a priority. Over time, uh, over the long term, page seven, the sums that they spent reflected the order of the priorities that they had set for their state. By calculating these sums, my book therefore confirms whether religious festivals or warfare were the overriding public priority of the classical Athenian people. With justification, the classical, classical Athenians believed that they staged more festivals than any other Greek state. The city Dionysia and the great Panathenaia, as you know, were the largest of their festivals and so accounted for a significant proportion of what they spent on their program of polis level religious celebrations. Therefore, costing these two festivals provides a solid base for working out their program's full cost. Wilson, I think, has reliably costed, cost, costed the city Dionysia. Consequently, in Public Spending and Democracy in Classical Athens, I focus on the Great Panathenaia. Attic farmers and elite chorus sponsors paid for a lot of this four yearly hair or tear. The evidence that survives allows us to calculate what each group spent. By adding these private spending calculations to the documented figures for public spending, I have established the cost of this second major festival. This table, which you see here uh, on the PowerPoint presentation, and of course audience members also have a copy of the tables in the handout, this table summarises my costing of the Great Panathenaia. Importantly, it parallels the cost estimate of the city at Dionysia by Wilson. I estimate that each celebration of Athena's festival cost 25 talents, 1,725 drachmas. That is some 600 kilograms of silver. Again, a very large pile of money. Wilson costs the other showcase of Classical Athens at the comparable figure of 28 talents, 5,200 drachmas. Private citizens paid for about one half of the Great Panathenaia. Likewise, Wilson shows that private spending on the city Dionysia roughly matched what this state spent. This means that our independent costings of the two major Athenian hair or tie corroborate each other. Over the four-year period, total spending on the Great Panath Panathenaia was on average six talents, 1,931 drachmas per year. Importantly, we simply lack the evidence to cost each of the other festivals of the classical Athenian state. But do not despair. We do know enough to estimate the scale of its two major festivals rest, uh, relative to the rest of the festival program. In classical Athens, the scale, the size of a festival, largely determined its cost, 
there's a direct relationship between cost, uh, between cost on one hand and scale and size on the other. This fact makes an estimate of relative scale or relative size enormously useful because it points to the proportion of the program's full cost for which these two showcase festivals accounted. The standard ritual acts of a democratic Athenian festival were the sacrifice, the procession, the agones, the contests for choruses and teams, and the other con uh, contests for inter individual competitors. My book quantifies, quantifies the scale of each act at the city Dionysia and the great Panathenaia and compares this scale to what happened in the rest of the state's festivals. These comparisons allow us to estimate safely what proportion, page 8, of total religious spending the two major festivals consumed. Because the costs of them are known, this proportion makes possible a cost estimate of the full program of Athenian festivals. So that's the method. Now let's look at the relative scale uh, with these different uh, ritual acts. The sacrifices, as you see here, of the city Dionysia and the great Panathenaia represented 8% of the 1,332 cows, and I should explain that I've rounded up to the whole cow in my calculations, uh, that the, the Athenian polis sacrificed each year. Their processions were several times larger than the 12 or so others that the polis staged. The city Dionysia accounted for 29% of festival liturgies, which funded team-based contests in three out of four years, while the two festivals accounted for 59% of festival liturgies. The contests for individuals at the Great Panathenaia represented 19% of all such agones and a staggering 83% of the monetary value of their prizes. On the basis of these figures, a cautious estimate of the proportion of total festival spending that the city Dionysia and the Great Panathenaia probably consumed is drum roll, pregnant poise, a very important figure, 35%. This 35% suggests that the entire program of polo-sponsored festivals cost about 100 talents, 3,231 uh, drachmas. That is, it is good you're sitting down, 2.6 tonnes of silver per year. And indeed, 2.6 tonnes of silver was a great deal of money. As you see here, it was comparable to what 4th century Athenians spent on running their government and was far larger than the total budget of all but the very biggest of Greek states. So that's really extraordinary. That is a huge expenditure on culture and religious rituals. Athens was, of course, the leading cultural centre of the classical Greek world. The disciplines of drama, oratory, literature and the visual arts were developed to a far higher level of quality in this state than in any other. Ever since Johann Winkelmann, seen here in fancy dress, Winkelmann was of course the 18th century pioneer of classical archaeology. Ever since Winkelmann, this cultural of this Athenian cultural revolution has been interpreted as a direct result of Athenian democracy. However, my high estimate of the full cost of Athenian festivals reveals two more reasons for the cultural revolution of classical Athens. These reasons were the extraordinary wealth 
of this polis and its elite. And the decision that its assembly goers regularly made that both should spend heavily on festival-based contests. In classical Athens, I should say first of all, moving on to the cost of war. In classical Athens, military spending varied greatly, as you know, from 430 to 350. In the Peloponnesian Wars course, the Athenians lost no less than 50% of their population. Their final defeat brought to an end their income-bearing empire. After this war, the demos were simply not capable of waging war wars on the same scale. This makes it necessary to calculate military sp spending before and after the zero hour of 404. In the 420s, the demos used imperial tribute and the surplus of internal income to pay for wars. For these two income streams, page 9, reliable figures have survived. The same applies to the war loans that Athens took out and the emergency taxes that it levied to pay for the Peloponnesian War's first phase, the so-called Academian War. By adding up these figures, public spending and democracy in classical Athens establishes what the Athenian state spent on its armed forces in the 420s. This table, which you see here, and again, you have it in your handout, this table summarises this adding up. The ground total for this military spending is, to use a casual Engl English expression, a mind-boggling 16,334 talents. This translates into an unexpected high average of 1,485 talents, that is 38.6 tonnes of silver per year. This astronomical cost of Athenian naval warfare fully explains why Pericles emphasised the centrality of money in his pre-war speeches. It also explains why the Athenian demos always believed that the dunamis, the military power, and the soteria, so the security of their state, depended on ships, walls, and especially money. For the 50 years after the Peloponnesian War, I'm sorry to say, no public spending figures survive. This means that the only, cost, uh, the only costing method that is available is the isolating of individual costs and, estimating, and the estimating of each cost on the basis of evidence. It was a nightmare, to say the least. <laughs> My book groups these costs of the armed forces into the basic cost, co cost classes of modern economics, namely capital costs, fixed operating costs, and variable operating costs. There is enough evidence to establish these two cost classes from the 370s to the 350s. With variable operating costs, however, this is only possible for the 370s, and I owe that finding principally to the work of Patrice Brun. Consequently, the full cost of the armed forces can only be established, uh, um, estimated rather, reliably in the decade of the 370s. The table in this slide summarises my estimates of the war's three cost classes. The annual totals of them range from nearly uh, 1,000 talents to only 140 talents, so a really big range from year to year. In the 370s, the average of the full cost of the armed forces was still, though, 522 talents. That is 13.6 tonnes of silver per year. 
And now I'd like to make some conclusions and to really think about the implications of these costings for our understanding of ancient democratic Athens. These cost estimates refute Burke's negative view on what classical Athens spent on festivals. In short, alas, Burke got, it, got his sums wrong. Admittedly, my costings reveal that Athenian het or tie, Athenian festivals, were indeed generously funded. The 100 talents that were spent on them each year was a large sum. Of this total, the city Dionysia and the great Panathenia accounted for 35%. It was therefore with good reason that Demosthenes focused on these two her or tai in his negative remarks about public spending. In spite of this, my public spending and democracy in classical Athens puts beyond doubt that vastly more was always spent on the armed forces. In times of war, this spending easily surpassed the combined costs of festivals and government. In the 370s, the total of annual spending on polemos on war was some 500 talents. This was five times as much as the Athenians were spending on their festivals. Page 10. With imperial income and enormous cash reserves, their 5th century forebears spent a great deal more. In the 420s, public spending alone, public spending alone on the armed forces was 1,500 talents per year. This was 15 times higher than spending on polis-level festivals. In times of peace, so when it, even when the Athenians were not waging wars, in times of peace, the Athenian armed forces still cost a great deal. In the 370s, their capital costs and fixed operating costs added up to 150 talents per year. This was 50% more than spending on festivals or democracy. In the 420s, and this is a terrifying realisation. In the 420s, Athens paid its cavalry corps three times what it would in the 370s and had twice as many guard ships guarding Attica's coasts. This means, and this is the terrifying point, this means that in times of peace, the Athenians of the 420s spent more on their armed forces than they did on festivals and politics combined. So this is even when they were not at war. The two literary passages that Burke presented in support of his view are clearly unreliable. The comparison that the young Demosthenes drew between the disordered polemos of his contemporaries and their ordered he or tai was part of his ill-conceived attempt to shame the demos into fighting Philip II. For the classical Athenians, order orderliness both encouraged citizens to be sophronaires, moderate, and played a big part in their success in battle. By describing their military activity then as, quote, disordered, uncorrected, and indeterminate, unquote, Demosthenes was criticizing his fellow citizens for their lack of an important civic virtue. These and other criticisms that, that Demosthenes made about Athenian war making in the 4th century were simply false. In particular, the demos of 4th century Athens usually spent several times more on a single naval expedition than they did on the city Dionysia and the great Panathenia. For example, in 352, when Demosthenes delivered his assembly speech, a naval expedition from Athens probably had 30 warships and was away for six months. The 36 talents per annum that the Athenians spent 
on these two festivals would have kept such a fleet at sea, sea for little more than one month. So it was a big exaggeration, to say the least, by Demosthenes. Less unexpected is the claim of Plutarch, which you see here, that at that 5th century Athens spent more on tragic productions than they did on maintaining their empire or fighting the Persian Wars. This claim was made in a display speech of the late 1st century CE that Plutarch probably, probably delivered at Athens. This speech's unusual argument was that the generals and the military victories of classical Athens were more deserving of praise than its historians, orators, poets, and visual artists. This unusual argument may have undervalued Plutarch's métier as a writer, but it gave him ample opportunities to display his rich knowledge of Athenian history, literature, and art. It was a display speech, after all. On the Glory of Athens was not a, was not a serious analysis of classical Athens or its public finances. Therefore, this speech's manifestly wild exaggerations about public spending cannot be taken face value. These cost estimates of festivals and wars do more than settle a 200-year-old debate. In classical Athens, the demos controlled public spending. They had, page 11, a good general knowledge of what the polis spent on its three major activities. This made it possible for them to change their spending priorities, and so what they spent on one type of activity relative to others. Their votes in the assembly thus allowed the demos to spend more on what they saw as a priority. Therefore, the sums that they spent reflected, over time, the order of the priorities that they had for their state. My estimates leave little doubt as to what this order was. Clearly, the demos judged the worship of the deities as important. But the enormous difference between the cost of festivals and the cost of war suggests that they saw polemos as their topmost public priority. This difference casts into doubt the often expressed view that religion was their most important activity. That war, instead, was their overriding priority is corrobor corroborated rather by what else we know of the place that it had in classical Athens. The Athenian demos were immensely proud of their military history. The regular speeches for their war dead, for example, show vividly, pardon, show vividly how the Athenians saw themselves as more courageous, courageous than the other Greeks. Their reasons for fighting battles as always just, and the history of Athens as an almost unbroken series of military victories. So we're talking about an extraordinary military, a cultural militarism. In addition, they saw fighting a battle as an opportunity for individuals and themselves as a group to put their courage beyond doubt. By reason of his military service, the poor citizen was recognised to be a Christos Polites, a good and useful citizen, or Cresimos te Pole, good and useful to the state. The ponoi, the toils that the Athenians bore in battles were repeatedly said to bring benefits. They had brought the security, the military power, alliances and other international advantages that Athens enjoyed. This military activity was constantly glorified and legitimised in the state's political debates, religious festivals and public art and monuments, 
as you see here. Polemos was not only held in the highest possible esteem by the classical Athenians, it also dominated their politics and their personal lives. Foreign policy was a major subject of political debate. War was a compulsory agenda item of each Prytany's main assembly meeting. Consequently, politicians required a good general knowledge of, in addition to public finances, the state's armed forces and the armed forces of the state's enemies. The Athenians, moreover, bore the ponoi, the toils, and the kindunoi, the dangers of war, much more often than they enjoyed the benefits of peace. In the 4th century, they fought constantly from 396 to 386 and from 378, 378 to 338 with only one year periods of peace. In the previous century, they had waged war in two out of three years and had campaigned non-stop on multiple fronts from 431 to 404. Whether by land or by sea, these military campaigns involved many thousands of Athenian citizens. In voting for them, the demos knowingly accepted that many could be killed in action. For example, in 460, as you see here in an English translation of the relevant casualty list. For example, in 460, one of their 10 Clisthenic tribes lost in one year alone 177 men in battles in, and think about the names here, battles in Greece, in Cyprus, in Egypt, and in Israel-Palestine. Even more extraordinary is the human cost of the Peloponnesian War. In 431, there were most probably 60,000 Athenians living in Attica. But after 25 years of this war, only 25,000 remained. In conclusion, the cultural militarism of Athenian democracy, its incessant war making, and the enormous costs of its wars, both in lives and in treasure, leave us in no doubt. The Athenian people judged their topmost public priority to be war. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh... David, pour cette euh, conférence extrêmement intéressante et, et brillante, euh, je crois, parce que elle montre euh, toute l'importance qu'il qu y a à, à faire de l'histoire économique, y compris lorsqu'on veut faire de l'histoire politique. Ouais. Et qu'il n'y a pas de différence entre les deux, comme on l'a très souvent fait, en considérant qu'il y avait les spécialistes d'histoire économique et puis les spécialistes d'histoire euh, politique, voire même les spécialistes d'histoire religieuse, puisque à travers la question des dépenses publiques, Finalement, euh, on a un prisme qui permet de saisir la totalité du fonctionnement de la cité et euh, du coup on est obligé de s'intéresser à quelque chose qu'on laisse souvent de côté, euh, à savoir la préférence des citoyens eux-mêmes, c'est-à-dire prendre la démocratie au sérieux et pas simplement enfermer euh, les anciens grecs ou les citoyens de telle ou telle cité dans telle ou telle préférence, en général euh, préférence qui est euh, estimée à leur place. Hein, C'est un petit peu le, le, le jugement d'Auguste Buck qui, euh, à l'aune de ses propres préférences, juge les préférences des Athéniens plus ou moins euh, sérieuses. Donc ça, c'est le premier élément qui me paraît extrêmement important. Il y en a un deuxième que je trouve important, c'est que, euh, au fond, ta réflexion nous amène à prendre de nouveau la démocratie ancienne au sérieux. Est-ce qu'on s'aperçoit que, même si on peut être en désaccord sur leurs priorités politiques, euh, nous sommes obligés de considérer que les choix qui sont faits sont des choix conscients et qu'ils ont parfaitement conscience que les sommes extraordinaires qu'ils consacrent euh, à la guerre sont nécessaires euh, de leur point de vue. Et donc ça ouvre sur un troisième point, euh, c'est la prise en compte du point de vue euh, des individus que nous étudions. Parce que le plus souvent, nous leur prêtons des idées. 
nous leur prêtons des fonctionnements. Or là, la question des dépenses publiques nous oblige, en particulier parce que nous sommes dans une démocratie directe, nous oblige à euh, considérer ces citoyens comme des individus rationnels, réfléchissant non pas ouais. avec notre grille de lecture, mais réfléchissant avec leur propre grille de lecture. Et je trouve que c'est une extraordinaire entrée pour reconstituer leur manière de voir, qui est, euh, comme tu l'as en quelque sorte euh, sinon souligné, du moins euh, implicitement euh, indiqué, une manière qui peut être très surprenante pour nous, tant euh, la masse euh, des dépenses est consacrée à la guerre et, et non euh, à la religion. Donc c'est ma question peut-être pour ouvrir la, la discussion, c'est dans quelle mesure tu penses que cette réflexion sur les dépenses publiques euh, nous amène à, à repenser la démocratie en général C'est-à-dire que euh, dans quelle mesure ces, ces, ces chiffres au fond qui paraissent très, euh, qui sont d'ailleurs très techniques, très euh, précis, très rigoureux, euh, débouchent sur une réflexion plus générale sur la démocratie oui, ok, thank you. Well, I, thank you, Christophe, for that, that, uh, that very nice summary of my paper and uh, for your very kind words indeed. And let's see, so I think that, I think that's interesting, actually. So I think that uh, my work on uh, public spending in democratic Athens has made me appreciate the value of direct democracy and value the fact that ordinary Athenians, in fact, were competent at making decisions about public finance. In addition, I'm intrigued when I look at this direct democracy, how it was actually organized. So uh, even PJ Rose recognized this about 50 years ago in his very, um, very technical work on the Athenian boule, that the institutional design of this democracy helped ordinary citizens to learn more about the state mm -hmm. and to gather uh, uh, useful uh, technical information to help them to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that I have learned about uh, in looking at this topic very clearly as well. Something that also strikes me is um, the issue, and you've written about this yourself, of course, is the idea of uh, institutional, of, of learning. And that means that ordinary Athenians ran the, ran the government in ancient Athens, ordinary Athenians made all the decisions in the assembly, hundreds of them were paid to be the magistrates and the judges of the democracy, many, many, just as many again were counsellors, they were the, 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 the bureaucrats, if you will, of the state for a long period of time. Now when these ordinary citizens actually performed all of those political tasks, they actually learnt something from running the government. So participating in the government was also a way to learn more about politics, to become more skilled about politics. So what they actually learnt in running the government meant when it came to making decisions, when it came to deliberating, they were more skillful. They were better at making decisions. So with respect to public finances, they, they had a pretty good idea about what the state was spending, what possible prosodoi or income streams were, and what were good for proposals for increasing in income streams or raising new new income income streams as well. So that's what I think I've learned that it was a, Athens was a very successful direct democracy, and the ordinary people who ran it learnt a great deal about the world from running the democracy, and what they learnt in running the democracy made them better at making decisions. I think your comment also spoke about um, how we can think about democracy in, in antiquity and democracy today. And of course, I think when we compare democracy and antiquity and democracy today, we uh, we need to be a bit careful because there are differences, hey. So, you know, I, I think, Christoph, you and I like to think, hey, we're all classical Athenians, you know, that's right. And, um, and, but, but in actual fact, the Athenians lived 2,500 years ago. They had different public priorities as well. So I think we need to be careful when we compare the, uh, the ancient direct Greek democracy and contemporary democracy. Having said that, there are still points of comparison. We do have elections. 
We have politicians who to compete with each other and compete for the support of an electorate. There is debate within parliaments and in civil society about policy proposals. There are competing policy platforms and proposals out there as well. There's an emphasis on the rule of law and so forth. So I think we can meaningfully compare these two things. And I think when we do that when it comes to public finance, um, it suggests to me that uh, we could do things differently today. And so uh, in your introduction, you mentioned that I had published recently a, tr a tribune in Le Monde. And in that tribune, I argued that from ancient Athens, uh, politicians today should, should appreciate that ordinary voters are more intelligent than they think, that ordinary voters can understand something complex like a new tax, a state budget, a budget law, that ordinary voters can, uh, uh, and therefore that politicians can speak more frankly to ordinary voters about public finances, about their plans. So that politicians in the future don't need, simply need to say superficial things like, en marche, <laughs> uh, for example. They can actually say, listen, I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to increase the budget. Uh, but if I increase the budget for the university sector, I'm sorry, we'll have to increase taxes. I, I think the lesson, a lesson we can t uh, draw from ancient Athens is that, is that um, uh, today, democratic politicians can speak more frankly about, uh, about public finances. Uh, just, but, but I'll make one last point um, before um, uh, we ask for more questions. And that is this, that ancient Athens, to use an English metaphor, particularly for Greek historians, is a light on the hill. You know, it is, you know, it's something to, it's the light that we go towards, it's shining Athens as we get from Pindar, it's this ideal. And that's true, I think, in terms of democratic design, in terms of making our own democracy today better, we can look to Athens, and it was a very successful democracy for 200 years. But Athens is also a warning for us. Athens is also a warning because democratic Athens was a war machine, to quote the great Nicola Rowe. Democratic Athens was a war machine. It spent more on warfare than almost the rest of the classical Greek world combined. Its fleet, it had more ships than the rest of the Eastern Aegean during, at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War. It waged war all the time. It killed thousands of Greeks and tens of thousands of barbarians. The Athenian democracy depleted its own citizen body through incessant war making. So this is a warning. Uh, this is a warning to us. Uh, this direct democracy was very good at putting into practice the preference of the Athenian demos. But the first preference for the Athenian demos was killing other Greeks and doing it all the time. So this is a warning to us. It means to us that democracy alone does not um, does not undercut cultural militarism, I don't think. You can have a wonderful democracy today, but if the preferences of an electorate are bellicose, there will be wars. So I think Athens, again, a lot on the hill for democratic reform, but when it comes to warfare and foreign, foreign, foreign policy, it, it really is a warning. Oui, je crois qu'effectivement, le... Il euh, y, y, y a tout ce qui concerne la procédure démocratique et, euh, et après les valeurs qu'une ouais, qu démocratie ouais. se, se donne et qui est euh, au fond une autre question ouais. et, euh, qui est tout aussi importante. Mais je, je, je crois que c'est extraordinairement intéressant euh, euh, ta réflexion parce que ça nous amène à prendre au sérieux la démocratie directe. C'est-à-dire que tout nous pousse aujourd'hui à considérer que la politique est une affaire de spécialistes. Ouais. Or finalement on s'aperçoit que dans un système qui n'a pas les mêmes capacité, en particulier en termes d'éducation de la population dans un système étatisé, parvient à fabriquer, forger des citoyens qui sont éduqués oui. et capables de comprendre des questions de dépenses publiques relativement complexes. Oui. Et du coup, comme tu viens de le faire, je crois que ça nous interroge sur la capacité permanente des responsables politiques à nous de nous tenir à l'écart des décisions économiques parce qu'elles seraient trop complexes. Parce que là, on a envie de se dire, bah, si c'est pas suffisamment complexe pour les Athéniens, a priori, pour nous aussi, ça devrait être compréhensible si on prenait la peine de, de nous expliquer. Et ça repose aussi, parce que je crois que tu n'en as pas parlé, la question du tirage au sort. 
C'est-à-dire qu'une partie aussi de l'éducation qui est faite repose sur le tirage au sort, c'est-à-dire sur le fait que les citoyens sont tellement citoyens qu'on les juge capables de participer de manière active ouais. au fonctionnement institutionnel. Et je crois que c'est un autre élément aussi qui contribue à la compréhension I... que les Athéniens ont de leur propre système. Look, I agree. I think that I think that's right. So I think that Athenian democracy was a very uh, successful f uh, form of government uh, given the success of the Athenian state. Uh, and again, one reason for that was that ordinary vote, ordinary citizens were very capable. But of course, it was also expensive. It was expensive. So sometimes it may may well be that um, Greek monarchies and Greek tyrannies were cheaper to operate. Okay, you didn't have to pay so many people. If the people got out of line, you just killed them, right? Yeah, uh, and you can you could pay a, a foreign specialist to actually run your treasury. So it was expensive. So I suppose that, I mean, but the but the Athenians made that choice. And I think you also spoke, Christophe, about a, a, a distinction which is very critical between, in, in a sense, institutions are also a reflection of values as yeah. well. This is true. Um, and so Athenian institutions did reflect Athenian values, got the idea of equality, participation, facilitating participation, open debate, the rule of law. law. So these principles can be mapped closely onto the institutions of the Athenian state. But I also think you're right that there can also be a difference between institutions and values too. And so people say about democracy today, that, uh, uh, that actually German colleagues are very good on this, that um, democracy today is a conveyor belt for the preferences of an electorate. So if a, if a, a, a citizenry if a body politic wants certain things to happen, they vote for politicians over time, and their preferences are translated into public policy. And that happened in Athens. That happened in Athens. Uh, I think what's interesting in Athens is that the spending of the Athenian state actually also matches very clearly very basic um, um, mentalities of the Athenians, very basic values of the Athenians. There are two that really spring to one. For the Athenian, for non-elite Athenians, non-elite Athenians were not highly valued in public discourse. Uh, I know in your work, you've, you, well, you know uh, um, from your own research that poor Athenians were considered to be um, morally inferior to rich people. Um, um, people were ashamed of their poverty. Um, um, Pericles says in his funeral oration, "There is no shame in being poor." The shame is not trying to escape your poverty. <laughs> uh, so, so, so Athenian disc public discourse was very interesting in that poor people were treated poorly, uh, mm. so to speak. However, in this public discourse, poor people were recognised for two things in particular. They were praised in this discourse for uh, uh, participating in the armed forces, for fighting wars, for being sailors and hoplites and also for being politically active and making a contribution to the state. So if we think that, that the two sources of esteem for this electorate were being soldiers and participating in the government itself, then it's not a surprise then that the Athenian state spent most of its money on warfare and on the government. So in a sense, the, these are the, top, the two top most priorities, and these top most priorities map perfectly the two areas where the demos could gain esteem and recognition. Oui, je, je crois que c'est vraiment une, une réflexion intéressante et je voudrais souligner euh, tout l'intérêt aussi qu'il y a à, à, à accepter que quand on parle de démocratie ancienne, euh, il est légitime de faire des liens avec oui. la démocratie contemporaine, parce que c'est souvent quelque chose qu'on s'interdit de faire au nom de la neutralité, de l'objectivité des historiens et des historiennes. Et je trouve que le, le travail que, que tu nous proposes euh, nous, nous oblige à euh, rompre euh, cette euh, muraille, cette, ce fossé, à, à combler le fossé entre le passé et le présent, parce que manifestement on ne peut pas euh, se poser la question de, de, de la démocratie euh, ancienne sans avoir... Euh, en tête les réalités de la démocratie contemporaine, sans se poser la question euh, du coût euh, de la démocratie, combien ça coûte, est-ce que c'est légitime euh, de payer, euh, de, de donner autant d'argent pour euh, avoir des députés, pour avoir un, un Sénat, pour avoir des ministres, donc toutes ces questions, euh, finalement, qui sont les nôtres, ne sont pas nouvelles, et elles n'ont eu de cesse de se poser. Et euh, ton travail montre que ces questions ne sont pas des questions économiques. 
mais sont de part en part des questions politiques. Puisque pour y répondre, il faut avoir une définition de la démocratie. Il faut qu'on se mette d'accord sur l'importance que euh, nous accordons au fait de vivre ensemble et de délibérer les uns avec les autres pour prendre les décisions les meilleures possibles. Donc de ce point de vue, je, je trouve que euh, cette réflexion est importante et montre tout l'intérêt qu'il y a à faire de l'histoire de l'Antiquité aujourd'hui, non pas simplement pour en savoir plus euh, sur les anciens, mais aussi pour avoir un point de vue euh, qui euh, nous permet de mieux comprendre ce que euh, nous faisons euh, collectivement. Alors, je ne sais pas s'il y a des euh, questions dans la salle ou non. Peut-être un dernier mot ou... Well, I, I'd, like to thank the, to, I'd like to actually thank the audience for attending. It's very good to see you here. I thank you again for your kind invitation. I'm delighted to be in Bordeaux, this wonderful city, a mag ma magnificent city. And I bid farewell to everybody who's listening online. Thank you very much, Christophe. Merci beaucoup, David.